Hello everybody, this is Keith Clark from iDigital Medium. I have a special announcement today. We hope your new year has started off well and we would like to tell you a little story. iDigital Medium has been working for four or five years uh, on efforts of preservation. One interest of concern has been MetaScience Foundation. That's the foundation that was founded by George Meek, mostly well known for Spiritcom. What a lot of people don't know is Spiritcom was only a small portion of what MetaScience Foundation actually did. Myself, Paranormal Study, ITC Voices, TDC Researchers, Faces and Sound, iDigital Medium, and anybody else that would like to jump onto the bandwagon, we are recreating MetaScience Foundation. We're going to bring it back. And today, in honor of the work that George Meek did and the vision that he had for the foundation, we're going to play one of our first historical audio clips of the year. There is much more to come. We have acquired mountains of historical data. We have hundreds of audio cassettes and recordings. We have hundreds of books. We are now MetaScience Foundation. Myself, Timothy Woolworth, Jeremy Michael Bloxham are heading up the effort. And we will bring, this is our intention to bring MetaScience Foundation back, to bring all this historical information to the public, to show the full story of the MetaScience Foundation, the full story of Spiritcom, to inspire more people in the world to be aware of the historical roots of ITC, where we started, um, how this all began, mistakes that have been made, discoveries that have been made, adventures, and all kinds of other things. We, we have been working with the previous um, president of MetaScience Foundation, Mr. Thomas Pratt. I had the good fortune of being here in Florida, where the material for MetaScience Foundation has been stored for decades. We have now acquired all of that information and material. And when we say a lot of material, we mean a lot of material. In fact, when we first discovered how much there was, we were kind of floored. Didn't quite know what we were gonna do. And we have been cultivating it over a long period of time. It's taken a lot of work, a lot of effort, a little bit of stress. I would say there's probably over 1,000 pounds, that's half a ton of material that has been recovered. We want to bring that information to you, the public, our friends. We want to bring it to the world. We want to bring it to the world for free. We want to digitize it. As you can imagine, there are costs associated with it, digitizing material, cataloging it. Um, sharing it, putting it on a website, domain names, all this cool stuff. So pretty here, soon here we're going to be doing a fundraiser. Um, we put a couple feelers out, at least Tim has, and I know that a lot of people in the community are interested in supporting the effort and we ask for your support. We haven't quite yet released the fundraiser, but in light of the new year and the celebra celebration of a new beginning, we would like to go ahead and begin to play this first audio tape for you. It's an audio, it's a radio interview from 1984 with George Meek and a Mr. Bill Jenkins. Enjoy and we'll be seeing you soon. KABC Los Angeles, Talk Radio, AM 79. Your thoughts and ideas are always welcome right here on Talk Radio. It's the place where you'll hear one-of-a-kind two-way conversations filled with information and provocative ideas. Talk Radio is entertainment in its purest form. Talk Radio is... Bill Jenkins!
Saturday night in Los Angeles, and welcome again. We're so glad to have you aboard. The seat is warm here from Dr. David Viscott, who did... <laughs> I hope you enjoyed David's show tonight. He worked his own special kind of magic, and it's always a delight to be here after David, because we want to continue the magic. But tonight, we want to continue stretching your imagination. We call the show Open Mind because we feel you need to have one here. And over the last over five years, we have spent a great deal of time and effort and energy to bring to you, for your perusal, if it were, some things that may cause you to open your mind. I have found in the past that everybody has a touch of uh, reality, and I call it their reality box. A reality that is formed by their their education, their belief systems, their living experiences, their religions. There are a lot of things that cause them to have a reality box, and, and that forms the reality box. And if you hear information that is outside of that reality box, you immediately deserve, decide that person's crazy, trying to put you on. Uh, he's lying to you, trying to deceive you, needs to be locked up. Or if it's the perception of your own senses that you yourself are hallucinating or... Maybe you need a straight jacket. But what we have found here is that that's not necessarily the case. And this reality box, you see, forms a window, and it's that window that we look at reality through, and we have found that most people look at reality through not a window but a peephole. And what we are about here tonight is to enlarge that peephole, if we may. And we have done that from time to time, and I want you to know that my people has hopefully become something more than that. I think it was about three or four months ago that uh, we had an, an electrifying evening here, you and I. And I played some sounds for you, some tapes that I that were given to me by Mr. George Meek of an electric a recording of a conversation, are you ready for this, between a person who was alive in physical life and a person who died in 1967, and the recordings were made in the early 80s. Well, we played those. I have great confidence in the gentleman who gave them to me. His name is George Meek. And the research that has gone on with his organization... He wouldn't have gotten on this show had I did not have that confidence. I had heard about him for a couple of years. Your reaction was electrifying. And I must confess to you that mine was too. And I am very, very happy to have in studio with me tonight, which I didn't have that night, George Meek. And we will have Dr. Mueller with us, who's been been gone for a while, but indeed lives on. George, welcome to the Open Mind Show. Thanks, Bill. It's a real pleasure to be here with your Open Mind audience. Do you know what you did to us? <laughs> you, know, you didn't know I was going to do that, really. You had given me the information. You had given me the, the cassettes. I worked with them, and I worked with it, and I just jumped in and put it on the air one night. I couldn't I, I couldn't keep this uh, from the audience out there. I want to tell you that the reaction to that night uh, was incredible. I also want to tell the audience right now that I had a few of my facts. Uh, not, not exactly correct. N not, nothing of any great preponderance. I was pretty much on time. You did an amazingly accurate job, Bill. Well, we'll get that squared away <laughs> So what you're going to hear tonight, and I uh, invite you to go ahead and turn on your tape recorders and call your friends. You are going to hear some live conversations, uh, or recorded conversations, between a person who is alive and a person who is dead. And for the dead, uh, dead's a wrong word, right? On the other side. Uh, you'll hear some new material that George has brought with us tonight. I think you'll find it poignant and uh, rather profound you'll get a look at what life is like on the other side. So many people wonder about that, and I wonder about it. And, George, I'm sure that you wonder about it, too. We have a new perspective for it. So that's, what's, what, that's what you're in store for. Do you think we can um, keep them entertained for two hours here? Jim? I think so. 
<laughs> All right. You can do, because if you've done that, then you know you can do anything. What do you think about walking on coals, George? I don't know whether I'm ready for it or not, Bill. <laughs> well, let me assure you. Let me assure you that you are. Before we go any further, could you give us a little bit of a background on your background and how you got interested in uh, in this field that uh, that we're in, which is, I think, enormously important. Mm -hmm. Well, just by the way of uh, background, uh, uh, I graduated from the University of Michigan in engineering. And I've spent most of the last 52 years in research and the creation of new industrial products. Uh, I built an, in, a reputation internationally, I might say, in this field. During one 18-year period, I made 44 trips to supervise a European research laboratory. Just prior to my 60th birthday, uh, I made a series of inventions and the royalties for these, from these made it possible for me to stop off my profession and hopefully to spend the remainder of my life in self-financed worldwide research into the basic nature of man. In these studies, during the past 14 years, I have traveled the world over five times and many, many foreign trips. Uh, I've been fortunate in building up a network of 28 colleagues consisting of physicians, psychiatrists, scientists, and parapsychologists in 22 countries. Uh, these works that we have carried on in the areas of health, healing, and life after death have been published in English, German, Dutch, Portuguese, Japanese, and four native languages in India. I am currently serving as the founder and director of Life Beyond Death Research Foundation in Franklin, North Carolina. But so much for my uh, background, and uh, now I want to uh, collaborate with Bill in presenting uh, this detailed report of our work since 1971 on what started out as the electronic voice phenomenon, but has progressed way beyond that uh, more or less catchphrase, which was invented at that time as being a little less offens offensive than to confess that we were talking with the spooks. Well, all right, we can we can go through all of that. We have done some shows here, and I um, I remember the ones we had with Bart Ellis, where we displayed a number of uh, um, examples of the electronic voice phenomenon, where you will turn on the tape recorder, you will ask whoever is there to speak, and every now and then you'll mm -hmm. find somebody talking to you. You know... When you were there, you had your tape recorder turned on loud, you didn't hear anything, and whenever you play the recording back, you get a little burst of information. Mm -hmm. Maybe a minute, or not a minute, a second or two or three. I might break in and say that I had lunch with Bart Ellis uh, today, and uh, I want to pay tribute to him and to uh, Attila Vanzali, uh, Raymond Bayless, uh, uh, and uh, Bill Welch. Californians who all helped lay the foundation for what uh, we've been working in the last few years. They did a great pioneering job right here in California. They certainly did. And um, that was uh, my first introduction, which was real early on in the Open Mind broadcast to mm -hmm. that, that such a thing actually existed. But you took it a step further. Uh, rather than having the little burst of information that happened catches cash can hopefully. Mm -hmm. You developed a process, or you and your colleagues developed a process where you could set up a an electronic device of some kind that could be actuated by someone on the other side, which is a mind-boggling thing when you get to thinking about it. Mm -hmm. The information that is available to us in physical life that is on the other side is limitless if we only knew how to break those bonds. We have emotional and religious reasons for thinking that that line is so static that we can't get through it. We're beginning to find out that that's not true. It hasn't been true for a long time. There are people that have been having communication with the other side, I guess, since man's existence. The prophets had that. Mm -hmm. The mediums had that. I think the great mm -hmm. inventors and the writers also were tapping into that knowledge that we're on the other side. But how could you 
uh, say that in other than a belief system way or a mystical way, or it is my belief that this is so. Now we're getting it down to science. Something electronically is happening, which uh, to me makes your work so very, very important, although it's very early and it's very embryonic in its uh, technology. The, uh, what it portends is enormous, seems to me. How did that get started? Whatever gave you the idea? I was uh, inspired to get into this from the uh, work that I said had been done here in California and similar work that had been done in uh, Sweden by uh, Friedrich Jurgensen. Uh, he had uh, started getting so-called uh, voices on uh, his tape recorder back in the uh, late 1950s. And uh, I went into it far enough by uh, 1970 when I started into this uh, research full time, as I indicated a few minutes ago. And I saw in 1970, at least to my conviction, that it was the start of uh, an entirely new window on uh, uh, man's reality. And I opened a small laboratory in Philadelphia in 1971 where some of my electronic friends and I could start doing some more serious work because we felt from the very beginning of our studies that uh, a much more sophisticated approach was going to have to be taken to the development of the equipment. And uh, we plugged along year after year. Uh, in the middle of the uh, 70s, we were very fortunate in coming into contact with a new researcher. William O'Neill, who had the great ability of being uh, so clairvoyant and so clairaudient that he could literally see and talk to uh, the people that we wanted to communicate with instrumentally. Now, let me, let me stop you there for just a second, because it may be a little bit difficult for people who are listening to understand mm -hmm. that there are people among us who have uh, developed their senses to a point that they can discern things that are outside of the range that we ordinarily discern with our five senses. Now, in your case, William O'Neill could tell when someone was in his presence that was uh, in, the, in the spirit world. Yes. Uh, not only they could see them and hear them. We've had many of those people on the air. Mm -hmm. It does actually happen. And William O'Neill was one of those. Uh, the fact that you, as a listener... <laughs> don't have that perception, and I must confess to you that I don't have it either. Uh, it nevertheless seems to very well go on. Okay. Well, Bill, in the middle 70s, Bill saw uh, and talked to uh, a little uh, uh, gray-haired man that uh, said that we should call him Doc Nick. Uh, Doc Nick had been a ham radio operator uh, as a hobby away from his medical uh, profession and he wanted to uh, work with Bill there in his uh, laboratory see if he could help Bill and he made a suggestion that uh, instead of the uh, miscellaneous kinds of white noise that the EVP researchers were using uh, such as the noise between radio stations or the running water from a faucet or rain on a roof, that uh, we should uh, use some audio sounds uh, as a part of the single sideband radio circuit that Bill was working with at that time. And uh, as a result of that, we had the great thrill on October 27, 1977, of hearing Doc's, Doc Nick's first words just barely coming through the quite loud mixture of to tones which uh, we had provided as a starting point. And uh, when we play, uh, when Bill plays this uh, uh, tape for you uh, in a moment, you, of course, will be hearing this tremendous static, background static, which is almost the same as I experienced some 60 years ago when I took a mother's oats box and wrapped a, a wire around it and made my first crystal set. But this, is, this was just the, the beginning. So you must remember that uh, what has happened in the last few years actually had its inception in this very, very crude exchange of just a few sentences in October 1977. 
But what we will be hearing, to my knowledge, and I think to yours too, George, is the first time it has been recorded an electronic conversation between a live person and a dead person. They're actually carrying on. In, yes, I agree with that. I think that's probably a first in history. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important sound to hear. It will be a little bit difficult to uh, maybe understand it, but you can understand it. And uh, what you've done, you've set up tones, and those are now modulated from the other side. That's right. And to the point that you can understand them. Yes. Now, whenever you hear the voices of Dr. Nick here and uh, Dr. Mueller, which we'll spend a great deal of time with, Dr. George Mueller, who died in 1967, I think it was, right. and these recordings were made in the 80s, uh, he will sound like a robot. In fact, I think uh, Bill O'Neill said, you sound like a robot. Well, he sounds like a robot. But you can hear his consciousness, you can hear his inflections, you can hear his voice, and that's what's in front of you. I'm going to mm -hmm. take a little break, and then, Bob, when we get back, we will go uh, and listen to the very first recording in history, I think, of a conversation between a person who was alive and a person who was dead. The live person being Bill O'Neill, who was a technician that works with George, and the dead person is someone who um, identifies himself only as Doc Nick. Right. So if you'll hang on, we'll bring that to you in just a second. You know, when you... It's a Saturday night. I'm Bill Jenkins. It's Open Mind. My guest is George Meek, and we are talking about life on the other side and communicating with him on this side. And as we told you just before we got going, the first conversation, I guess the first recorded conversation in history between a live person and someone on the other side. Now, this is William O'Neill, who is a technician that works with you, George, and it's Doc Nick. Uh, that's how he. Uh, is that what you called him, or is that how he did? That's how him? he identified himself. Uh, okay. So uh, it's not going to be the greatest quality in the world, but you have to remember you're listening to a very, very historic piece of tape. So let's listen, shall we? Yeah. 
That was, I let that run a little long. I know it was long, uh, hard to listen to. I know a lot of people are recording that tonight. But I wanted you to hear it because it was probably one of the most historic things that you can ever hear. Literally a recording of the first time that a living person talked with a dead person. Mm -hmm. I know that may be very hard for some of you to comprehend. But from all we can tell, that is exactly what happened there, George. Uh, shortly after that, uh, we lost contact with uh, Doc Nick, but uh, it was our great good luck to uh, have uh, Bill make a uh, clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairvoyant contact with uh, Dr. George Jeffries Mueller, uh, who introduced himself and obliged by giving his social security number telling us where we could go to a small town in California to uh, find a copy of his death certificate. And uh, uh, he began what turned out to be a perfectly fabulous piece of research in combination with uh, Bill. Uh, initially, uh, before uh, we got up to the point where we had Dr. Mueller uh, coming through on instrument, uh, we had many, many months of two-way conversation between Mueller and O'Neill, and uh, I was able to, during this phase, uh, I got Bill to let a tape recorder run continuously so that uh, it would take down anything that he said, and whenever Dr. Mueller would speak, then uh, Bill would take time to repeat it. Dr. Mueller got a little irritated at all this lost uh, motion hearing, hearing what he said come back from Mueller. But uh, it developed a tremendous amount of useful information, which a little bit later then enabled uh, Dr. Mueller to further improve the system so that uh, we could get his voice coming through via instrument, as you will hear later. But I want to share with you this uh, interim step where Mueller and O'Neill uh, conversed via this method that I just discussed. I want to ask you a question. Could you set the scene for the audience of what that laboratory is like and what you had in motion there? Well, <laughs> uh, I chuckle about it because uh, I, uh, we, when most of us think of laboratories today, we think of the large, uh, uh, shiny uh, laboratories run by universities and by uh, industry. And this laboratory hardly dignified the name. It was one small room in a farmhouse that had been built about 90 years uh, previously on a very isolated road in the mountains of uh, western Pennsylvania. But it uh, was adequate for the very simple equipment that we were using in this early phase of our work. Did you ever see Thomas Edison or Nikola Tesla's laboratory? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was uh, even more primitive than uh, Thomas Edison's laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> well, a laboratory is where you're doing things on the outer reaches of man's imagination, really, and it could be mm -hmm. anywhere. Right. But you did have electronic equipment going. We certainly did. You were setting up uh, electromagnetic tones. How did you do arrive at those tones? Well, uh, we did not arrive at those until we got through this phase that I'm just describing now. It was after months of discussion between Bill and uh, Dr. Mueller. Who was dead. Uh, yes, who had died 15 years previously. Dr. Mueller drew on his lifelong uh, hobby, which was the study of the theory of music. And uh, he suggested a, a total of 13 audio tones, which spanned the adult male voice, uh, going from 131 cycles a second to 701 cycles per second. And uh, that information and a lot of other very helpful information was developed during this phase when the communication was only by the means which we will now have on this next excerpt of tape. So what we're hearing are just tones that have been established electronically by you. Yes. 
Do you set up a microphone for the other ones to speak into, or, or what? Yes, I, I would like to describe that in detail, Bill, but from a, uh, but that does not apply to this piece of uh, tape, but I, I would like to have him go right now. When he finishes this, I, I will describe for the listeners uh, the, the, the actual equipment that then, from that, from that point on, all, this, all the excerpts, Utilize in, in their production. So this next tape is going to be with uh, Dr. Oh, George Mueller. Uh, only the conversation between Mueller and O'Neill. Uh, we can't hear Mueller's voice. We merely hear uh, O'Neill feeding back what uh, what he said. Oh, I see. What he has said. And then from then we find out how to hear Dr. Mueller himself. That's right. But we should establish. But, but, but this went on for months, uh, and uh, there was I've got notebooks filled with very fascinating information which uh, Mueller brought through at this stage and which we built on mm -hmm. for the next stage of our communication. And project. from that way, uh, from that information, you were able to actually build this, this Spiritcom device. That's right. So it was designed on the other side almost in a yeah, way. Right. Uh, we should establish that Dr. Mueller, your research has shown, did exist. He was involved at the University of Wisconsin, as I recall. He got his master's degree in physics from the uh, University of Wisconsin, his doctor's degree in physics from Cornell University, and then he held many jobs, uh, important jobs, in the uh, aerospace industry. And as your research showed, he, he gave you unlisted telephone numbers, and you checked those out and find them to be unusually positive. Mm -hmm. Uh, he gave us so much personal data on his own life that if we ever get around to writing it up, it'll probably be the best documented case of survival that is on the bookshelves yeah. anyplace. Well, what I'm trying to establish here, you know, for the listener, yeah. is that all at once there was this entity mm -hmm. affecting your electronic gear who identified himself as Dr. George Mueller. Dr. Mueller as a result of your investigation, did exist. He gave you an enormous level of very personal information that right. wouldn't be found in books anywhere, and there are right. some really bizarre stories about some of the information that he gave you. That's right. Dr. Mueller really existed. And the character and nature of Dr. Mueller came out, as we will hear later in the Spiritcom, uh, conversations which were very much a part of his. He was a hard-nosed guy. In fact, as I recall, and we'll, we'll hear later, he said when he was on Earth, he was a jackass, in fact, right. <laughs> uh, which created some problems for him on the other side, uh, which is very poignant uh, about what happens whenever you're over there. So we will listen to this first conversation mm -hmm. with, uh, well, it's really a one-sided conversation, yeah. but uh, Bill O'Neill is repeating what Dr. Mueller said. Right. We will hear Dr. Mueller a little bit later. Right. Let me take a pause so we can get to that because I can't wait myself. All right. Um, if you're ready in there, we want to listen to this. This is one of the first conversations with Dr. George Mueller. We will not hear Dr. Mueller, as I understand from you, George. We will hear Bill O'Neill repeating what Dr. Mueller said. And this was a precursor to the Spiricom device. Right. All right. Let's take a, take a moment and listen to this. It's quite fascinating. Dr. Mueller. Uh, uh, please, sir. Yes, sir. I, I'm looking. Yes, sir. I can see your lips moving. Well, you're pointing to your what? Your mouth. I don't... Yes, I can see. Yes, I, that's what I'm saying. I can see your, your lips. Yeah, now, now, now it's getting better. Now it's getting better. Uh, do you... Uh, oh, boy. When I... When I uh, tell you that, when your voice starts to, to fade, Dr. Mueller, and I, and I tell you that, do you do, you do something, make an, a, an added effort uh, uh, to uh, make your uh, uh, vo voice audible again to me? No? You simply talk to me because you want to. You don't... Oh, you've never thought about what? how it comes about. Oh, you find it interesting, too. Oh, I... Oh, you would have found it interesting, too, were you in my place. Yes, I see what you mean now. Yes, sir. Well... Oh, yes, that's... I, I agree. I don't know whether... Uh, no, here we go again. Why not calling George or Mr. Meek? 
Now, I don't know whether uh, uh, that'd be satisfactory to my, okay, quote unquote, book writing friend or not. But uh, yes, it would be, yeah, yeah, it would be less. Yeah, here we go again. Time consuming, uh huh. You say there's no such thing as time, but, <laughs> oh golly, excuse me for chuckling, Dr. Mueller, but you use the word time. Oh, I have it. <laughs> I see. You, yet you say there's no such thing as time, but you continue to use the word force of habit. I see. All right, sir. Well, uh, gee willikers, I don't know. Uh, I would say, Dr. Mueller. Dr. Mueller. Dr. Mueller. Oh, golly. Are you still here, Dr. Mueller? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, Bill was obviously a little bit flabbergasted by that, right? <laughs> but for those who just came in with us, this is Bill O'Neill. He's a technician that works with George Meek, who is our guest here tonight on Open Mind. And Bill was having a conversation with Dr. George Mueller. We were not privy to it, and he was trying to repeat what he said. But I want you to hear, Dr. Mueller, and we will set up the tones again and let you hear. I guess this is the first recorded conversation with Dr. Mueller, who actually existed. They researched that Dr. Mueller was real. He died in 1967, and in one of the excerpts, we find out it wasn't too, uh, he wasn't too happy with the way that happened. What was it unnecessary surgery or something? Or he, he thought it was. Yeah. In fact, as I recall, he looked for most surgery is unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, but let's hear that conversation, because out of these, these kind of conversations with Bill O'Neill, you learn to develop the electronic process to actually communicate with someone on the other side. So, Bob, if you'll play that tape. I think that's much better right there, William. Yes, sir, I understood, Doctor. Very well. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, doctor. I'm sorry. I was lighting a cigarette. Yes, I did, doctor. Very well, Doctor. Now you can very definitely hear Dr. George Mueller. Yes, he sounds like a robot. But you have to remember that with the electronic apparatus that Bill O'Neill and George Meek and his group have set up, Dr. Mueller from the other side has has to have, an, uh, I suppose, an energy source in order to modulate those tones so that we can understand it in this much more dense level in which we live. Is that saying it in a way? That's saying it very well, Bill. I, it, it, when I hear those things, it runs chills up and down my back. You know, we deal with the fact that life goes on, uh, that there is a, that the other side is really home, and uh, that we're out here on an excursion. But we now are looking at technology produce a window between life on the other side and this side, uh, a window that here before had been reserved for the uh, the mediums, the real good mediums that were doing that. That and the kind of mental direct communication that many people have received. In fact, I think everybody has from time to time of influences from the other side. But here's technology at work. What did you think whenever that first happened? 
Well, it didn't come quite as much as a surprise to us because we'd been working at it for years. We, we knew this day would come. The only, the only question was when. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mueller told you so many, many, many things. Yeah. I, in, fact, in fact, you said you could write a book yeah. about that. We're going to listen to some more of, yeah. of, of Dr. Mueller. But uh, I, I, I think that we have spent 50 minutes here yeah. provoking the imagination of the audience, yeah. and I want them to have a chance to talk to you. We want to hear Dr. Good. Mueller, and we will. Let me give you the numbers. If you're in Los Angeles, well, all the numbers, as you know, end in talk, T-A-L-K. In Los Angeles, the number is 520 if you're out in the San Fernando Valley, 990. If you're in Pasadena, Glendale, or Burbank, your number is 244. If you're in the San Gabriel Valley, 448. If you're in the South Bay area, 679. If you're in Long Beach, San Pedro, Paramount, Compton, that area, 639. And our good friends in Orange County in the 714 area code or the 619 area code, your number is 750. And if you're down there in the 213 area code, some of you are, your number is 448. Call us, talk to George Meek, and talk about this breakthrough in communication. We call it the Spiricom device between those on this side and the other side. And I know there are a lot of questions in your mind about what is it really like over there and this great conversation that you've had with these people. And here's an opportunity to have it. What else can we listen to here? We we'll, we'll really have a bunch, but I want to go with you, George, while we're waiting for the calls to come in. All right. Well, uh, after uh, we take these calls, I think that our listeners might be interested in uh, listening to another uh, communicator on Spiritcom, a man who said that he had died 151 years earlier. That stretches the imagination even further, but I believe that that's the next tape that you've got laid out. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's number three, Bob. All right, let's take a, a listen to that. And then we'll get to our callers. Now, did, did he identify himself at all? Uh, yes, he said his name was Fred Ingstrom. He said that he had lived in the rural area of uh, western Virginia. We were not able to, uh, and that he died in 1830. Uh, we were not able from the scanty birth records in, those, in that area to actually identifying the way we did uh, Dr. Mueller. So we do not have that same degree of documentation that we had with respect to Dr. Mueller. All right, well, let's listen to Fred here. Again, another one. Um, you're subject to anybody coming before your microphones, yeah. really, when you turn on the device, right? Absolutely. It's what we call a drop-in communicator. And let me uh, forestall a couple of uh, uh, calls here by uh, uh, pointing out that you may wonder why Fred Ingstrom, who said he died in 1830, uh, uses some modern terms such as uh, robot and some slang phrases. Uh, we learned that Fred had been standing around in the laboratory for some weeks uh, watching uh, Dr. Mueller uh, communicate with Bill, and he had picked up some of the terminology which they were using. Well, I just got a note from Bob, the engineer there. We don't have time to play Fred. We'll get okay. that back. Let's go to a caller and Fine. see what they're I know that Ho, for Fine. instance, has been uh, on the line for a while. Ho, welcome aboard. Are you there? There I am. Good okay. evening. Yeah. Good evening, Dr. Meeks. Good evening. Uh, i got to tell you, I've waited months for this follow-up to the original show that Bill did, and yeah. that was really quite something. I've heard through the grapevine, that maybe you can confirm or deny this, that there have been some people that the open mind listeners may recognize have come through or at least been mentioned. One is Rosemary Brown. I've heard that Rosemary Brown was brought up at some point or another. Is that true? Well, Rosemary Brown is still alive and well. Oh, I realize that, but that uh, somewhere down the line I had heard that Rosemary Brown's name or that the work she was doing was brought up by the spirits from the other side. Uh, not to my knowledge, sir. I, I know of no, uh, no reference to uh, Rosemary's work uh, through our activities. I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, Rosemary's work. She's done a marvelous job, but there's no cross-reference to here that I know of. Uh, uh, Ho, let me stop you for just a second, maybe do a little explaining, and maybe I can uh, solve your problem. Uh, for those who don't know, Rosemary Brown is a psychic in London, and uh, Wimbledon, actually, uh, who is in contact with the great composers of uh, the past, Liszt and Beethoven and the rest of them. 
And uh, for a woman who has no mus musical training, she is producing the works of the masters, and she's just taking dictation from them. Now, there was a mention of Rosemary Brown by Dr. Peoples, who has been on the show before, and there may be the confusion. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, has there been any reaction from either anyone in the government or from any of the religious people about the work that you're doing? No, we have not had any uh, contact uh, by uh, government uh, authorities, and uh, we have not uh, sought any contact with the uh, religious organizations. They have not, uh, con none of them have contacted us. They probably wouldn't understand it anyway. Perhaps not. I just, I think it's fascinating. I live with a trans medium, and I know quite a few, and it's so marvelous to have something scientific that backs that up. Because so many people have said for years that, for example, mediums are simply split personalities and things like that, and mm -hmm. this really proves that that's not the case. When you, when Bill did the show originally, he talked about a video system that was hooked up as well, and there was an excerpt that he played where they were saying they were getting forms and no faces. Has that advanced at all in the last few months? Uh, there's been no significant advance in the last few months. Actually, we have concentrated our work on the audio portion, we could see that the video problem was going to be even more complicated than the audio. And with our limited personnel and uh, resources, we have decided to uh, uh, place our main effort uh, on the uh, audio communication. It's called taking baby steps, Hope. I understand. <laughs> Believe me, I do. All right. It's marvelous work. Keep it up, and thank you both. And, Bill, keep up the good work. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. easy for me to keep up the good work when I have people around like George Meek who are keeping up the work and, and so many, many others. And I don't believe that this first hour has gone on by. <laughs> we have so many more things for you to listen to, and we want to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can. And I'm so delighted that George Meek flew in to be with you and I tonight and to talk about Spiritcom and let mm. you listen to these incredible incredible recordings. We'll be back after the news. Well, I hope you're riveted. I'm riveted. It's hour number two of the Open Mind Show tonight, and you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate I get to come to work and do this, and they pay me to do it. And I love every single moment of it. It's the high point of my week. And to be able to share with you the things that, that come across my desk every day is... Uh, a delightful thing to me. With me is George Meek of the, what do we call that, the Life After Life Foundation? Uh, Life Beyond Death Research. Life Beyond Death Research Foundation. Something that, of course, we talked about here for the last five years, that it does exist, it goes on, and because of George's research, we now have technological proof of it. If you weren't with us the last hour, we listened to some amazing conversations, some historical recordings of... William O'Neill, who was a technician in your organization, talking with two different people, Dr. Nick and George Mueller. Uh, George died in 1967. Dr. Nick died what, back in the 1800s sometime. But we have a recording of a live conversation going on. And I have another surprise for you. And he's on the telephone right now. And, George, I know you don't mind. No. Uh, let's take a moment to talk to Dr. Frank Baranowski. And I'm so, so glad that Frank is in town because, Frank, from another aspect of this matter of continuing life, life on the other side, has been deeply involved in it. His research, I think, is profound and probably is the avant-garde uh, look at hypnotic regression moving people into other lives. Now, where you're talking to people who have gone over to the other side and are residing there and now using technology or conversing with us, uh, Frank's technique is to bring out these past lives that have gone on, and he has some amazing stories. Frank, are you there? Hello. I did press K. Frank. Yes. There you are. <laughs> are you, you listening? You sound great. It's a terrific program this evening. Well, thank you very much. Uh, say hello to George Meek. Mr. Meeksa, I'm deeply uh, interested in your research. Well, I've just learned about uh, yours for the first time tonight, and Bill has promised to uh, help me get up to date on the fascinating things that you've been doing. It seems to fit right into our work. Oh, so many. Uh, I had the pleasure of staying three days with Rosemary Brown way back in 1973. Uh, you mentioned briefly some of the work that's coming through her. 
And uh, in one of those days, I watched her work on about uh, 17 different manuscripts uh, in the course of two hours, uh, adding a few notes here, a few bars here. When uh, you could feel the coldness, the, the heat or the warmth of the room would change when she'd say, uh, Chopin is now here. And he, by the way, he greets you as a countryman. Uh, I happen to be Polish. Uh, Franz Liszt would One would never know with a name like Baranowski, right? <laughs> well, I tell everybody it's Irish, Bill. Because <laughs> when I tell them about my lucky Polish leprechauns, nobody's ever heard of them, you know. So, anyway. Uh, Do you know what she did for me? Rosemary Brown? Yes. No. The movie we're producing? Yes. Heirs of the Gods? Yes. We have a sweeping new, brand new theme originally for Heirs of the Gods written by... Sergio Rachmaninoff. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, the, the lady is as honest as they come, believe me. Yeah. And when she is saying that she sees these people, she's communicating with them, she really is. Uh, Bill, have you heard of, a, of a, another amazing woman named Professor Marilyn Rosner from Montreal? No, uh, other than a brief conversation we had this afternoon, I had not heard of her. Uh, yes, I've heard of her. Marilyn uh, is... Uh, is a, is a professor at Vanier College, and she works with uh, close to 500 physicians. Uh, she helps them with their patients. She'll look at them, and she says she is able to communicate with, quote, unquote, spirit guides, uh, and they will tell the subject what they are lacking of uh, calcium, so on and so forth. Uh, she has completely amazed so many of these medical people uh, that they work with her rather than against her. Her husband is a full-fledged Anglican priest, and she has stunned the canons of that church with her accuracy in describing canons who have passed on, who have served various posts throughout Canada, and uh, names, uh, information, and she'll say, well, they're standing right here. Don't you see them? Uh, they made a film on this young lady two years ago, the Canadian Broadcasting, and uh, perhaps it's the most highly played documentary uh, in the provinces. She has her own television program called Beyond Reason, uh, her own radio program, and now her own columns are appearing in a few of the Canadian newspapers. She is, well, startling. Well, we'll try to get her on uh, this fall. Okay. Uh, you may have some difficulty because I think she... Uh, I have difficulty getting people on in this fall. <laughs> you know, I have to rearrange to do that. Bill, she, uh, I, I think, told me on the conversation she's going to be home in Montreal 17 days this year. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, yeah, she travels around a lot. Uh, she just came back from India helping with uh, Mother Teresa. Uh, <laughs> she has been accredited by the uh, government of Spain because of her fantastic ability to come in and tell people what they're lacking in their educational system. By the way, she's a behavioral therapist. Uh, and an educator. Uh, her degrees are, well, many. Uh, I think she graduated from high school at age 11, a regular child prodigy, who was teaching at universities at 16. Well, Frank, you know, you deal with what we call this window between physical life and um, spiritual life. Yes. And from what you've heard tonight uh, of George's work, where does that stack up in your mind? Well, it, it gives you a, a moment for pause here. Uh, let me say that this type of work is very difficult to understand. Uh, we look at the entire field, Bill, as, say, for instance, the psychic down the street. How accurate uh, is the psychic down the street? And you and I know there are more psychos running around than there are psychics. <laughs> yes, well put. Well put. <laughs> and if you can gather this information to a degree of credibility, you can go up to the next step. We've been talking about the possibility that you may or may not have lived before other lives. And then suddenly now we're trying to prove that there are voices from beyond the grave, uh, voices that are there from entities that have not what decided to reincarnate didn't have to and here they are coming into what we consider a new form a new channel our world but it isn't new. uh edison in his writings uh in fact instructed his wife that there was a special closet he did not want destroyed after his death because he believed that those who had passed on would remain close to those that they loved 
uh, and wanted to be with and would communicate with him. Now, with Tesla also communicated with him, and he credits mm -hmm. uh, his great inventions from friends on the other side. Oh, gosh, for heaven's sakes, yes. So, uh, oh, and, what, and Marconi. Oh, there's so many here, see? So we have to look at this, this idea that there is more to our world than what the five senses can uh, glean or subject themselves almost immediately. They're now, very primitive, those five senses. Exactly. What I've been doing, as you know, is this research in reincarnation, trying to find out why we have talents, why we have feelings, uh, say for one another. You know and I know many times you've met someone for the first time and, and you feel like, why, hey, I know this person and yet you've never met them before. Or suddenly you meet someone and, and you, we say, get bad vibes from them. A very poor grammar, but uh, nevertheless that describes the feeling you have immediately. And you wonder why. Why does this one person completely make your life mellow, the other one makes it a very angry, frustrating type of life? Is there a stem, a cause from perhaps something beyond what we can see? Well, under hypnosis, we're able to go into that phase. And, yeah, hey, I've done over 6,000 people now from 25 different countries. And the, the documentation is, is it's coming up fantastic. Bill, you and I haven't talked lately about one of the cases I've been really wrapped up now since 1980 with. Uh, you're the, talking uh, about... Our good seaman friend. That's right. The lady, Sharon Johnson, uh, who in reality was a man who died on board the USS Nevada uh, at Pearl Harbor. Now, we've got tied up in this research over $33,000, and that doesn't say very much when you compare it to the hours of hard legwork researching documentation. Not only describing places that were there at that point in time, by the way, this lady is only 27 years old, but describing people who work in those establishments. Uh, that's, that's where it's very hard to, and if it takes us such a long time to prove her words right, how did she come up with these facts in the first place? No way that she could have known them unless her consciousness experienced them, because that's she couldn't right. read them. And if I can go forward, some of the information that she gave you was sealed in naval records. That's right. Uh, we had to go through John Rhodes uh, in, in, in the House. He was a, uh, any kind of political tool we could come with at this point in time. And some of the things we've, uh, we've discovered, uh, hey, we've proven the Navy wrong in many, many cases. Hmm. Uh, so there's, there's no doubt in my mind that you and I have been here before. We all have. The thing is, what can we glean from this information? How can we use it as a viable tool now? Speaking to the dead or talking to those on the other side, unless we can use that wisdom that they have, that, that insight. That's uh, a great repository of uh, knowledge and exactly. information over there, and it is time to learn how to tap it. Frank, would you stay on the line? Oh, certainly. And uh, just kind of stay with us through the evening, because we want to listen to some more of these uh, incredible recordings. Incredible is a wrong word. Incredible means not to be believed. These are things to be believed. Let's just call them astounding and amazing in certainly historical recordings. Only that, amazing, though, Bill, because we haven't heard them before. That's what makes them amazing. We'll try to make them old hat here after a while if we, if we can do that. So. going to listen to uh, this conversation from Fred Engstrom, who died in back in the... 18 months? In 1830. In the rural area in western western part of Virginia. And for those of you that have just joined us, what you're going to hear is a recording of a conversation between William O'Neill, who was a technician with George's organization, and Fred, who has been dead since, well, a long time. And uh, the communication is done electronically. And you have a recording of it. You've never heard this. It is real. This went on. It is not fabricated in the back of George's uh, garage someplace. And this is the way that went. Yeah. 
secret. Now, let me, let me make a little change here, okay? If you can hear me, you'll be able to hear you'll be able to hear that because I'll make a tape of it, okay? Okay, yeah, oh boy, that would be mine. Oh boy, that's why you said that because you were married you know, and you were married. Oh about eight years. Oh, well, you know, uh I'm 63. Well, uh, Natalie, <clears throat> I feel like I'm in my 20s, but when I when I shave, my mirror says, "Who are you feeling, old man?" Okay, Fred. Good night. Good night. Okay. Now, I realize that the technical quality is not uh, the best in the world, but they are very, very historic. Mm. Uh, I wanted you to hear those. Fred Ingstrom had some things to say about marriage, and uh, his last contact with uh, physical life was over 100 years ago. That's right. So one of the things we've learned, uh, Bill, from these uh, years of work is that time, as we know it, serial time, just does not exist in these other realms. Mm -hmm. Frank, you heard that? What do you think of it? Good heavens, I think this man should be really congratulated for the hours of his life he's given to these tapes. You and I hear them, but hey, we we don't see the uh, the labor. And it's got to be a labor of love. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm yeah, this has been a quest. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're all involved in a quest, Frank Baranowski. You are, I am, George Meek is. We have so many people. There are so many things to quest after that show us that the reality of the world that most of us see is not much, and there is another world out there to get deeply involved in. Let us go to our callers right now. I know they have some questions. I think Randy is on the line. Randy? Hello. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, I've been waiting very long for this follow-up program, too. I'm <laughs> happy you got it. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I am really amazed with this uh, research, I wanted to ask if... Uh, in any of your conversations with the other side, if there's any mention of God or any relationship with God or religion or anything. In the case of uh, Dr. Mueller, <clears throat> he was uh, very reluctant to mention the word God. He would tell Bill, I don't want to discuss religion in any way, shape, or form. But to give you perspective on that, uh, Dr. Mueller 
uh, was on a very, very low level uh, of existence uh, in what we call the uh, etheric realms or astral world. Uh, Dr. Mueller had uh, uh, done a number of the things uh, in his life that he had occasion to regret when he got on the other side. Well, he called himself a jackass, actually. Uh, yes, later, later on, after he uh, moved up and got some understanding, uh, he uh, did uh, say that I certainly was a jackass. Uh, but uh, if I may say so, we were fortunate in a way that he uh, did these things and wound up where he did because he was down where the energy level was such that we could reach him with the Mickey Mouse type of equipment that we had had. If he had <laughs> well, let me put that in another word. The equipment you're dealing with is extremely primitive. In fact, probably, uh, and you describe it well, more primitive than Alexander Bell's first telephone. Right. which would only work in one direction for about 150 feet. So right. Right. you're not as far as advanced as they were with a telephone. Right. So you were able to reach Dr. Mueller. Now, those that have moved to the other side and have started moving up the levels that are over there, uh, their vibratory rate increases uh, in one, one way of explaining it. And yeah. I think perhaps right now, George, and if you don't mind, Randy, I would like to uh, have George share with you some of the words of uh, Dr. Mueller because you have regained contact with him, but not through the Spiritcom device. You're having to do this through a transmedium. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, read those excerpts? All right. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, this is uh, through a very, very uh, special telepathic channel, <clears throat> a 75-year-old woman with whom we have been in contact now with Dr. Mueller for the last eight months. Uh, at the uh, much higher level uh, where he presently resides. Uh, and uh, I'm quoting now from a recent transcript from Dr. Mueller. It says, As Meek knows, I am gradually spiritually maturing, so I now better, better understand more data as time goes by. Let me clarify this statement. On my plane of consciousness, we spiritually and mentally progress in pulses, sort of a cyclic pulsing. In other words, we expand consciousness, so we do not travel per se. When we here show a desire to evolve, our soul and mind pulses to that area in higher consciousness where instructors await us. I have learned to ask for a teacher on my own level of awareness, for it's stupid to try and skip grades. And now on the point that uh, uh, Bill mentioned about his uh, uh, new level of understanding, I'm skipping down later in this transcript, and says, uh, I am not afraid now to ask for help. On earth, I was a jackass. Yes, George, you can print this. I was a stubborn jackass, but being as stubborn as a mule gets you into the lower astral realms, as I found out. When I need help, I ask for help, and help is readily available. I am sure that George will be pleased to learn that I made many personality improvements Perhaps you do not realize that when you land over here, it's not all at all easy to shed old habit patterns you felt sort of comfortable with. And it's very difficult to shed habits accrued in past life experiences. Of course, the good thoughts and actions scoot you to a higher plane. Look at it. Look at the law of life as having a ledger. It has to balance. And you, every single one of you, is a personal recorder of your own cosmic diary. Don't forget that. It's folly to hang up there with stupid habits and thoughts that didn't appear at all stupid, at least to me while on Earth, while I was fumbling around. You get a different perspective here, and as on Earth, the first requisite is a desire to progress. Do I sound like a preacher? Well, I would have to say, yes, he does, when we compare it with uh, the level of understanding he had two and a half years ago when we talked to him via our instrumentation. And certainly the history of the man, which is well documented, is well known, uh, says that he's had quite a change in personality. So we're only uh, basically communicating with one level of consciousness then. That's it, in a way. Uh, Frank Baranowski, yeah. are you there? Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to interject a thought here. Uh, with the gentleman was asking about uh, whether there a mention of, of God. Yeah, that's Randy. And I, and I feel I know what he's, what he's looking for. Uh, this is another phase of our research currently, or the, this is the current number, I should say. I have now had the pleasure of speaking with 1,196 people who have had what we call near-death experiences. Uh, many of them have actual death certificates. They were dead uh, 17 minutes, 27 minutes. A psychiatrist in Atlanta built dead five hours, if you can imagine. Okay. Uh, of those 
those 1,196 people, 773 said something very similar. They heard uh, a voice, uh, don't know where it came from, it said, stand up in the presence of your creator. I, I thought that word creator was rather interesting because now, these are people from various walks of life, not one specific religion. Uh, some had embraced the Mohammedan religion, some had embraced the, uh, the Jewish faith or the Christian or whatever have you. But they used the word creator. It didn't say God, Messiah, Savior, Jesus, Allah, or all of these other terminologies, but the word creator was used. And I wondered, why not God? Why creator? I don't know. Uh, followed by a second question. Uh, and again, of the 1,196 people, uh, rather interesting, 812 heard the second question, uh, which means there was a, a lack of about 80 people that didn't hear the first one. Uh, what have you done for mankind? Another, another significant question. Uh, out of 1,100, of course, 1,196 is, is a small, minute number of the hundreds of thousands of people who have these new death experiences. But why would they do the same thing? What have you done for mankind? And well, I think, saying, it's, uh, I think it's significant. Is it conscience? Uh, is it the Christian-oriented guilt uh, that you've got to do for something with somebody? Or is it really uh, what you're here for? Uh, I think it's what you're here for. Uh, the purpose of life is the evolvement of the spirit, and, of course, evolving the spirit is involving the light of mankind. And, and here I, I find this most, most significant, uh, that you have a man here who is picking up this information, who on the other side is still trying to help mankind. And still trying to uh, improve along the way. Fantastic. Does that help your question, Randy? Yes, it does, very much. All right, I appreciate you getting in here with us, and thank you for hanging on as long as you did. Thank you for your time. We're going to take one more call, and then we'll get back to uh, another conversation. George, you look like you have something you want to say there. No? No? All right. We have uh, Audrey on the line. Audrey? Yes, hello. How are you? I want to address my question, Dr. Me. Certainly. Yes. Um, within your research and therefore your knowledge, I'm concerned about if you've lost a loved one who committed suicide. Uh, does that make a difference in terms of cosmic, astral level, whatever, or possibly communication. Does it make a difference? Uh, I'm First sorry, thing. Audrey, there was a noise here in the studio. Would you repeat the last part of that? Uh... No, I just wonder, does it make a difference if a person has taken his or her own life? Committed suicide. Oh, yeah. my gracious, it certainly does. That's the most uh, well, uh, non-productive step that anybody can take. In the first place, we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that uh, uh, you cannot terminate life by committing suicide. That is actually a no-no unless it's in a very, very rare case where the uh, taking of one's life is for a sacrifice uh, purpose, purpose, such as one of the explorers in the uh, South Polar exploration well, so a, a few years ago. Excuse me, what I'm asking, you know, if you, you have lost a very loved one, who has taken the life, does that change the astral level or communication? Or? Yes, it, it means that they have not learned in this life uh, how to uh, cope with affairs, and they have that learning yet to do. And uh, they uh, wind up, I might say so, on a lower level than would otherwise be the, uh, be the case. There's, not, there's no, no permanent damage. As I said, no, uh, a person cannot uh, die permanently. But uh, our studies uh, certainly confirm that the purpose of life is continuing mental, emotional, and spiritual growth. And uh, sooner or later, each of us has to uh, learn that in our own, own way. And the loved one that you're speaking about uh, will have to, in due course, uh, learn that lesson. Taking a life is taking a life, whether it's yours or somebody else's. Of course, that's disturbing to me to hear. Well, there are always disturbing things but, in life. But one of the uh, great things we feel about this type of work we're doing is that uh, in the years ahead, uh, when the knowledge is uh, more widely disseminated, there will be fewer cases uh, of the type that you just talked about. Yeah, and, and here in life, she was a very psychic person yeah. and uh, had great insight. Yeah. But just to reach the end of her uh, endurance, I guess. Yeah. Sometimes you have to look upon it. I know it, it, it sounds rather harsh to say, but that becomes a easy way out of a situation that needs to be dealt with. And you know, people do come 
across some very, very well, horrendous things to have to deal with. Age and illness, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Don't despair. Uh, the cause is not lost. Uh, she will... Uh, no, I would hope that she would be right up there with everybody well, else. <laughs> well, uh, every, everything will come around. Okay. Well, this may take a little bit longer. No, I did ask her, you know, my question. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Audrey, and I, under- I understand your concern. Yeah. Thank you. Bill? Uh, Bill, if I may uh, uh, comment here, a couple of people have addressed Dr. Meek. Let me say that when I uh, got out of engineering school in the depth of depression in 1932, uh, a doctor's degree wouldn't have gotten me 10 feet closer to the head of a soup line. So, <laughs> so you didn't get the doctor's degree. I have never had occasion to go back, but I think it's probably the work that I've done continuously for the last 14 years uh, in this field. Uh, gives me some uh, uh, creditable standing, without, I think even, I, with, even without the doctor's degree. I, you know, doctor, a, a doctor in front of your name doesn't necessarily mean it. It's what oh, you no. are and what you've done. It's a PhD or a doctor, whatever. All right. Audrey, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Appreciate it a lot. I, um, we, w- we want to get back to another one of uh, the conversations between Bill O'Neill and uh, Dr. Mueller, but I want to take a little break to do that. Frank Baranowski is on the line. Feel free to... Uh, I have questions for any of us here. Fifteen minutes away from midnight, it's Saturday night. I'm Bill Jenkins. It's Open Mind. My guest is George Meek. We're listening to recorded conversations between Bill O'Neill, who was one of the technicians working with George and his group, and in this case that we're getting ready to listen to, Dr. George Mueller, who died in 1967. The conversations were made in the early 80s. So uh, that may be stretching your imagination just a little bit, but it happened. And let's listen to... you want to set the stage for this conversation, yes. George? <clears throat> this uh, final uh, excerpt that we'll have time for tonight uh, shows the great value of the technical assistance which was given by Dr. Mueller. Uh, you will notice a very specific technical details that he is uh, sharing with uh, Bill O'Neill that relates to uh, pinpointing an electronic circuit problem on the video apparatus on which he and William were working in April 1981. All right. Bob, you want to have him play that. Just a minute, Doctor. Yes, I know you're here, but I've got to... I'm going to cut down the volume of these other frequencies. I want to cut them down to a level that won't... Uh... Schematic, Doctor. Very well. Uh, schematic over there in the file. Very well, yes, William. Yes. Yes, Doctor? Yes, Doctor. All right. 
There he was, uh, correcting the equipment as he went right along. That, that uh, went in line with his character, nature, and personality. It certainly was, and it was about as specific as it could be when he said that, uh, Bill needed to put in a 150-ohm half-watt resistor in parallel with a .0047 microfarad ceramic capacitor. But that shows the level of uh, communication which uh, they had reached after several months of work with Spiricon. We won't have time to hear it tonight, but there's another one where he got a little bit testy with Bill. Uh, first of all, he got a cheapie from Radio Shack, and he didn't like that. <laughs> and uh, another time he uh, displayed his uh, take-charge attitude, and in researching Dr. Mueller, that was the kind of guy he was when he worked at the University of Wisconsin in his research Well, and then his, his uh, industrial work, where he had, uh, oh, some of the jobs he had, uh, found that his annual budget for his own department was $50 million a year just for the personnel, so he had to be that kind of a guy. Yeah. <laughs> and it certainly came out. Uh, we hope we will have time, and uh, we'll try to get to it. Uh, yours is not the only work going on like this. Some work is going over, uh, going on in Europe, and, uh, and and in fact, they've done exactly what you want. You've got other minds involved in this thing, and they've kind of fine-honed the process. That was the purpose of going public, so to speak, uh, two years ago this Easter, to encourage other researchers around the world to get into into the work. And we've been so happy in recent months that. Uh, uh, Hans Otto Koenig, a uh, uh, German researcher, has uh, come along now, replicated some of our work, and is getting the loudest, clearest voices of anybody uh, uh, in Europe. Out of some 1,200 researchers over there, his uh, voices have uh, uh, been of better quality. And uh, recently he has uh, taken his equipment to Radio Luxembourg, and uh, set it up under the eyes of the technicians and uh, then proceeded to get uh, voices uh, which he's been able to share with uh, a million listeners uh, in northern Europe. Now I'm getting very envious. He brings the device and we do it live on the air, right? <laughs> George, uh, I want to talk to you about a future Open Mind show where we, we will try to do that or get Hans over here with it. That one I want to do. We have time for another caller, and Donna, I think, uh, is on the line, and she has a question about a friend of yours. Donna, welcome aboard. Thank you. Yes, George, we've been to the Philippines several times since, not, well, every year since 1977, and are good friends of Joaquin Cunana. Yes. And my question for you is, and I guess if it's the wrong answer, my fervent plea to you is, are there any other printed materials other than what Jack gave us with the first tape a couple of years ago with K, Franklin, North Carolina, uh, 28734, and uh, we will be glad to send you the information as to what's available. Franklin's not a big town, and they know George there. <laughs> okay. And if you miss that uh, address, and we'll try to get it on the air again, we have it on record here for you. It's called Broadcast Information at KABC. More than happy to uh, send it along to you. Uh, Donna, anything else on your mind before we... Well, I was going to ask, George, is there anything... We'll be going back to see Jack uh, in early July. Is there anything printed here that I can take him to add to his collection? Just those things. Just those things that okay. I, I referred to. Uh, I keep in touch with Jack. Uh, Jack is one of the members, uh, 28 members that we have in 22 countries on the International Advisory Panel that uh, is helping to guide the uh, destiny of Life Beyond Death Research Foundation. So uh, Jack uh, is kept reasonably well up to date on all of our activities. Okay. All right, Donna? Thank you very much. And thank thank you. you for your work, George. Thank you. Thank Bye you for your checking in and for your interest. Appreciate mm -hmm. it very much. Let's take a moment, Bob, and play a little bit of the tape from Europe. Uh, this is not the only place that this is going on. We won't be able to listen to all of it because our time is running short. But I wanted you to hear that it is happening all over the world. Scientists and researchers and... Mm -hmm. Uh, realize that this is a great portal for knowledge and information, the likes of which we have never known before. And here is some of the European research that's going in on. In which we are able to compare the voice of the deceased co-worker of Hans Otto König, named Walter Steinöckel. Walter died in July 1980 and naturally as he was working before 
in EDP, we have several copies, records of his voice during lifetime. Shortly after his death, König was able to receive the paranormal voice with the name Walter Steinekel, and we are able now to compare the two voices. In this experiment, ultraviolet light was used as a carrier and after reception by an ultraviolet sensitive photodiode, the signal was demodulated and mixed with the original ultrasonic signal produced at the same time in the lab. At first, you hear the voice Walter Steinöckel as originally recorded. Now, the same voice after filtering. Now, the voice of Walter during lifetime. In this example, he was calling his deceased father, starting with, here is Walter Steinhoeffer. Here is Walter Steinhoeffer. I guess we can see that there is that uh, amazing likeness there, George. I wish we could listen to the whole thing, but our time has run out. But the, the research goes on all over the world now. The portal does exist, as though, though that may trouble some people because of their concept of reality, but the reality of the world, as we've been trying to tell you here, is not what we see it. I know that all of this has given you some thoughts. Would you want to share them with us? In closing. Well, it is my hope that at this Easter season of 1984, Bill Jenkins, Bill O'Neill, and I have exposed you to some rather positive evidence that your very own mind, memory banks, and personality will survive the death of your physical body. All of the evidence from our 14 years of research indicates that the funeral, which awaits each of us, is just a rebirth or a graduation in what can be a whole new and exciting world of unlimited horizon for all of the Easter weekends ahead. And that's our Easter message for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Join me next week, and thank you, George Meeks, so very, very much.